So I always, the, the, the two points from these two slides that I really wanted to, um, I guess, hone in on for myself as a teacher is remembering that, as I said, you can do a book in class and it gives them a sense of success and therefore motivation. And then also, like, to try to create as much as possible. And so some of what I'll talk about later will kind of discuss how to create um, and different ways to use creation in like vocabulary and stuff like that. So when we look at potential books for the ESL classroom, um, these are a list of slides that share with us what we look for, right? So the first one, we know we look for length and complexity. We also look at the book itself. If a book looks like there's too much on the page for young learners, that's oftentimes really stressful, especially if there's too many words, right? Because they're like, I don't know about any words. And no so, pictures. And no pictures, exactly. <laughs> and that's, I think, in the next one. Um, illustrations should be interesting, right? And they should help the students understand the story. Another thing is, like, we have to make sure that they have um, 75 to 80 percent of the words that they can recognize and identify and they are able to use. Otherwise, we're at the, um, remember how we talked in previous sessions about I plus one? Mm -hmm. So this keeps it at the I plus one level, right? If they have 75 to 80 percent of the vocabulary that they already know. And then they're just challenging themselves a little bit more than what their base knowledge is. Um, which is motivational. So, the, also, we want to select books that we think we will enjoy. Because nine times out of ten, right, when we're working with young learners, we're reading the stories over and over and over <laughs> and over and over again. So if you hated it the first time, imagine how you're going to feel about the book on the fifth time, right? You want to make sure that it's something that you also enjoy. Um, so, the nice thing about young learners is because they do like books over and over and over again. It, it really is a great way to think about interacting with vocabulary. And I love Dr. Seuss's books because they are, they are just drilling vocabulary over and over and over again. So here's an example. This, the foot book, um, it has only 131 words, so it's very manageable, right? That's not that many words, especially when we consider that 47 of those words are either feet or foot. <laughs> so they're getting a lot of repetition. Um, and so, oops, you can, while you have only, you know, 131 words with 47 of them being feet or foot, you can still spend an ignore, and not an ignorement, but like you can spend a lot of time, as you can see, five to six hours on this one book. So it's repetitive. It's the same as when we were uh, looking at How the Grinch Stole Christmas. The actual book on How the Grinch Stole Christmas has a very small amount of words, and um, a lot of it is repetitive. It's sing-songy, so you could actually sing it with them. That might help them um, with their reading. So, okay. Next. Um, So, again, another expert who's talking about how much children don't mind repetition. They could do it considerably um, many times a day, many days a week. Is it okay to say do not tire? Yeah. Not the word to be, to be tired. Yes, right. Um, you can say it's it's the same. Like you can say um, they do not get tired of reading the same, or they do not tire of reading the same. I think um, she was probably trying to make it uh, sound a little more meaningful by saying they do not tire, because. Um, get tired is very common, it's very usual, and when you're writing a research paper, you're trying to choose words and organize them in an interesting way to keep the audience active as they're reading, you know, and so you, you correctly put phrases 
that wouldn't necessarily, in common speech, go that way. But it doesn't mean that they're wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. The other, <laughs> the other thing, um, we want to consider the language that we find within the textbook itself, right? So, for example, um, the footbook uses opposites in counting. So, if you're teaching them in your textbook about opposites and counting, it may be perfectly acceptable to use the footbook because it will be um, along with what you've been teaching them already. And another one is we're going on a bear hunt. So this one is great for teaching vocabulary about nature. So you have forest, river, cave, mud, snowstorm, and also prepositions. So there are a lot of use a lot of usage of the different prepositions like over, under, and through. Another one <laughs> is inside a barn in the country. And so this actually focuses on animal names and the sounds, which you can imagine is particularly good for very young learners because they like to have the sound and the ability maybe to act out what the animal would be while you're reading the book and doing the sound at the same time. Okay, so when we structure a reading writing lesson, this is primarily focused on reading. Um, we want to think about incorporating these four elements. So we have singing, possibly. We have listening. We have maybe even dancing or some sort of TPR. And we also have drawing. So with singing, having them sing the passage itself or recite the passage as a chant, some sort of form like that. Um, listening, I remember when I was a student, this was my favorite thing to do, listen to the teacher reading the book aloud. I, I fully remember like the teacher just sitting there. <laughs> and I would just be enraptured by like the, the story itself. So I also sometimes ask the students, if they get a little fussy sometimes in class, I ask them to visualize the story, pretend they're playing a movie in their mind while I read, and so they're seeing everything. That works for it was visual. sitting on the floor. Yeah. We never do it. You never sit on the floor? No. In the class? Not in school. <laughs> Not even in the library. Not even. <laughs> oh. But that's okay. I mean, I also remember in fifth grade, so I was way, way old at that point. You know, compared to like a kindergartner, a fifth grader is like a god. They're so old, <laughs> which of course they're not. But I, in fifth grade, my teacher also read, but she read books that were really, really different. For example, she read a book called The Cry of the Kalahari to us which is about a scientific research team who goes to the Kalahari Desert to do research on lions. And so a lot of the vocabulary was actually like, what? But um, it was a really good story, and it was fascinating to see these two people struggling to live by themselves in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. They had nothing. Um, and so I think that was when I also learned to like visualize in my mind. So that's what I encourage students to do. That was a brief aside. So dance. Again, having TPR. So students get out of their chairs for some physical activity. You're welcome to sit here, or there's another seat there if you feel more comfortable. Or right next to her. That's <laughs> fine, too. Um, so there are an like, unlimited number of possibilities in terms of dancing, right? They could like do a little role play of just actions of the story. and all that kind of stuff. Are your kids normally comfortable doing role plays? Yes, they like it. The younger, like it. The younger they're more encouraged. The younger are more encouraged? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, when they get older, they're too cool, right? But we did the same. You remember one of the seminars, we have a working just around the tables and doing some things. Like one of the, walk. Walk. the freeze walk, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, and some okay, but yeah, freeze walk. 
It helps. <laughs> it does help. It does help. And when we did the angel song, you guys were very active. So doing stuff like that. And at, you could actually do the angel song sort of thing with vocabulary in the story, right? So you can read the story and have them do specific actions for specific parts of the story at the same time. Um, and that is more or less dancing, <laughs> but just in their seats. <laughs> and then drawing. We'll talk a little bit more about this later in terms of keeping a vocabulary notebook. But I like to have students draw. Do you remember the shoebox thing? Mm -hmm. So for some, in some cases, I don't have enough physical objects to put into the shoebox. So oftentimes what I'll do is when we introduce the vocabulary, I might have the students draw it. So I might draw it first, and that's in my big shoebox at the, at the head of the class, right? But then when they have their individual shoeboxes on their table, then they draw, they are each responsible for one vocabulary word, or more than one vocabulary word, depending on how many you want in the shoebox, and they draw them, and um, if they can write, they write what it is, depending on their level, and then they put it in the shoebox, and then your shoebox is created. <laughs> And you're recycling the information. <laughs> so you're like killing two birds with one stone. Um, so that's always nice. Types of activities. So listen to the story on tape as read by the teacher without looking at the text. That could be one. Or listening to the story and reading along. So those are very common. Do you ever tape yourself reading the stories? Sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, I like to, um, there's a, a website where you can get free music off the internet, and so sometimes I like to use like the Audacity software, but I get this free music from the website, and then I, depending on the story, you know, you could have whatever type of music you'd like, like horror music in the background, or um, classical mozart -y sort of music. So, if you Google copyright free music heaven I think you'll be able to find this website easily I forgot I think his name is Kevin McCoy but he literally has hundreds of small segments of music that he himself created and he's also a teacher and so he provides it free for us it was here yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really I thinking he is yes, yeah yeah, did he do music? Did he sing? Yep. He always he sings. Guitar. Yep, yep, yep. He's now a regional English language officer. So, but his, his music site is really nice. My students used to use it when they were making their podcasts. They used to use it as background music for their podcasts. So that was really nice. Okay, um, another one is listen to the story and put illustrations depicting part of the story in order. Right? So they could have the storyboard in front and they listen and put them in order. Uh, read the book to a partner and then switch is another activity that's commonly used. Write your favorite words, new words, words starting with A from the story in your notebook. Basically just whatever you as a teacher feel like they need work in. If you want to focus on teaching um, A, B, C, D, starting working with words that begin with those letters so that they're familiar with them or if they're a higher level and you want them to actually know the word itself, doing it in that way, having um, favorite words or new words. So, these are different ways to do it. Other types of activities, um, write a portion of the story in the workbook, and I'll share the workbook with you later. The guy who was quoted on the slide before, his last name, Brown, um, he put together this idea for the workbook that I really liked and have used, and it was really successful, so I'm sharing his idea. Um, and I have the, his reference later if you want to read more about what he said. And answering. So the WH questions. So who, what, where, when, and then of course how. So what went on in the story. So those are different types of activities that we do, and also I love playing Pictionary. Do you, have, you played Pictionary before? It can be so much fun. So basically what Pictionary is, I've, I've seen it done in several ways. So 
my way of describing Pictionary may actually not be what Pictionary actually is, but I call it Pictionary. <laughs> so there's some, there's several ways to do it. One is where, given that you have a blackboard, right? And so most of our blackboards are pretty big. You could have two students at each time drawing a picture. And say you would be one team, they would be another team. And then there would be one representative from you and one representative from your team. And what they would have to do is they'd have to draw a vocab one of the vocabulary words from the book. And their team would have to guess what it is. And so you're reviewing vocabulary and reinforcing through images. So if I were to... Um, Let's practice. <laughs> what is this? Mouse. Louder. Yeah, it's a mouse. Okay, very good. Um, what is this? Yeah, very good. Okay, what is this? Boat. Boat. Okay, and you keep going. What? You couldn't guess? <laughs> yeah, so basically you give them a bunch of pictures that they have to get through, and they have maybe one minute or two minutes, and the, the student who is drawing has to draw as many of the pictures as possible. Like, oftentimes, it, when you give it, there are words, and they have to draw the picture. You don't want to actually give them the picture itself, unless they're young learners, and then they could try to draw the picture so that people are practicing. And so after a minute, the team with the most amount of guesses, well, correct guesses, so the most amount of right answers is the one that wins. And then they send a new group, like a new a new artist up to the front and then they have the game again. So that's Pictionary. And it's quite a lot of fun. 